Day 781 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So, starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses as currently Russia sits on more than 454,000 military personnel losses, representing an additional 770 in the past day. Then, as for hardware losses, six tanks, 31 APVs, and 41 artillery. And just as a quick note, I look forward to creating the percentage value of the exhausted Soviet stockpile levels for some other key figures right here. Just as I've done with the artillery percentage value so far. Reason being, when percentage figures reach 80, 90, or 100% of resource utilization, that is to say the amount of destroyed hardware based on expected Soviet stockpile numbers, or indeed Russian personnel loss figures, then once it reaches those levels, strange things start to happen. And I'll give you another example of that shortly in this video. Then we'll head to the map and we'll start out in Russia, as at this stage, multiple regions throughout Russia are dealing with the rising floodwater levels that continue to threaten dam safety, for example in the Orenburg region where the Ural River surged to 12 meters or about 40 feet and far exceeds the maximum limit. And full evacuations are underway in multiple new settlements as the risk of other dam failures looms. And authorities warn of imminent danger if water levels continue to climb. Additionally, in the Kurgan Oblast, which is northeast of Orenburg, the Tobol River has risen again, reaching 4.2 meters, with quote, big water expected within four days, prompting residents to stockpile a month's supply of drinking water. Problematically, melting snow and heavy rains swell the Ural River, which has only exacerbated the situation for the regions. Then, in the remote Siberian town of Abaza, nestled in the Kakassia region of Russia, if I can find it here, there we go, a state of emergency has been declared as rising floodwaters and formidable ice jams threaten the area. Russian media reports that local authorities have dispatched technicians to the scene, tasked with the perilous mission of breaking up ice jams and alleviating impending flood risks. So the icy waters continue to surge, while emergency services work as they attempt to mitigate what appears to be a looming disaster. Then just lastly, and just north of here in Tomsk, so central Russia, Heavy floods have triggered a partial collapse of the earth embankment alongside a bridge spanning the local river. The raging floodwaters have already inundated several sediments in the region with water levels continuing to climb at an alarming rate. Emergency crews are working to fortify the compromised embankment structure as residents in the affected areas prepare for potential evacuation orders. And in all of these stories, there is no mention of assistance from the Russian army, which is, of course, otherwise practically completely subdued due to the warring conflict that the Kremlin started in the west of its country. It's a damn shame. Then we'll head to the Donbass in Ukraine as in a bid to secure a symbolic victory by May 9th, which is Russia's biggest military parade day of the year, Russia has set its sights on capturing the city of Shasiv Yar. Also, according to the AFU's commander-in-chief, Russian troops briefly penetrated closer to the narrow canal bypass section, but were fairly swiftly repelled by Ukrainian drone and artillery strikes. And now, to bolster defenses, the AFU has reinforced local brigades with ammunition, drones, and electronic warfare equipment. So as Russia intensifies its offensive, aiming to reach the Seversky Donetsk Canal and advance toward the Kramatorsk direction, Ukrainian forces remain entrenched, holding the line against daily assaults as the battle for Shasivyar has become a crucial milestone in Russia's relentless push westward. Then, moving further down near the Avdivka axis, we saw Russian forces make an advance about half a square kilometers worth on the northwesternmost end of that region, near to Novo Bakhmutivka, as they largely moved along the eastern side of the railway line. 
And we've spoken a lot about Novo Bakhmutivka before, as it's just beyond the settlement of Stepova. So where this Ukrainian-controlled settlement is believed to have set up quite the level of extensive fortifications, which the AFU commenced the building of some time ago now. Then, somewhere in the east, we saw the results of effective work of the Ukrainian Baba Yaga heavy drone on Russian positions using incendiary munitions. That's right, incendiary munitions released from a drone. Then, also in the east, we saw Ukrainian border guards destroy two more Russian BTR-82 armoured personnel carriers. Then, after that, we saw the destruction of two Russian Ural 4320 trucks in the village of... Kodima in Donetsk, which is impressively at least 10 kilometers or about 6 miles inside of Russian-held territory. Then we saw more examples of, for instance, a destroyed Russian BMP-3 infantry fighting vehicle near the village of Orlivka, which is the frontline area just south of Berdichy. But perhaps most fantastically, we saw some examples of some marvellous Russian contraptions getting destroyed by drones and done so by the perhaps now famous 72nd Separate Mechanized Brigade who repulsed these attacks, as they appear to have developed quite the aptitude with their FPV operators and their drones. And some of these vehicles look like one of the Flintstones cars. Yabba dabba do. Although, to be fair, I might be mixing up this step-level looking vehicle to something out of the Beverly Hillbillies instead. And then lastly, something I want to show you guys in the region. So, the wreckage of a downed Russian KH-22 missile that was then found in the Donetsk region as well. So, this is a large, long-range anti-ship missile designed in the 50s and entered service in 1962. Then we'll briefly head across to the one of the most active regions within the Zaporizhia Oblast as a Russian serviceman involved in transport and evacuation has taken to Telegram to shed light on the dire situation at the Robotina foothold. He describes the area as a hotbed of intense combat where Ukrainian firepower reigns supreme, all making for a treacherous battlefield for Russian forces. The serviceman's first-hand account stands in a stark contrast to the narrative portrayed by Russian television, which he claims paints a misleading picture of the reality on the ground. And we've heard sentiment like that expressed from Russian soldiers before. But at a certain point, the, the Russian public at large will have to come to terms with the lies they've been fed on Russian state media TV. Then I briefly wanted to move to Crimea because, as we well know, Ukraine has set its sights on destroying Vladimir Putin's prized $4 billion Kirsch bridge within the next 100 days, thereby aiming to cut off a crucial Russian military supply route and thus choke Putin's war machine. And it's very much expected that Ukraine would pull off this feat with a multi-pronged attack using Storm Shadow missiles, sea drones, and the upcoming F-16 jets. Now, the heavily reinforced bridge, which now acts as a symbol of Russian occupation of Crimea, has been targeted at least twice, quite famously, by Ukraine's spy agency, the SBU, followed by its repairs that took about six months apiece. And now, Ukraine plans a fierce third strike to permanently compromise this structure. And I suspect to do so would include a large flurry of air and sea drones to inundate Russian naval and air defences. Aerial drones on the bridge and naval drones to target its very foundations. And speaking of naval drones, we'll head to some news now as in a Ukrainian hardware update, a spokesperson of Ukraine's security service has unveiled a new generation of maritime drones with the Sea Baby 2024 edition taking center stage. This cutting edge unmanned vessel boasts an impressive payload capacity of nearly one tonne, coupled with an extensive operational range now surpassing 1,000 kilometers. The spokesperson emphasized that these enhanced capabilities allow Ukrainian forces to strike targets virtually anywhere within the expanse of the Black Sea. 
So as the conflict persists, Ukraine continues to innovate and refine its drone technology, solidifying its position as a formidable presence in the maritime domain, thereby posing a significant threat to, to Russian assets in the region. Oh, and just to, to give you a bit of context there about the range, so the 1,000 kilometer range will get this sea baby to almost anywhere in the Black Sea, with the only exception being the Turkish and Georgian shores. So these are clearly some big improvements for Ukraine's Black Sea endeavors. Then in some more news, Lithuania has pledged a substantial contribution of 1.2 billion euros to the EU's newly established Ukraine Assistance Fund, aimed at bolstering military aid to Ukraine through the purchase of ammunition and equipment. Lithuania's interior minister emphasized the country's unwavering support for Ukraine and recognized the country's fight as a shared struggle. Then moving across to something of a Russian hardware news update, and hear me out on this one, because in a significant geopolitical shift, Serbia is poised to sign a 3 billion euro deal with France for a dozen Dassault Rafale fighter jets, marking a pivot away from its long-standing reliance on Russian aircraft. Now, the war in Ukraine has prompted Serbia, one of Moscow's closer allies, to diversify its arms purchases with a Serbian official stating that buy-in from Russia is no longer feasible due to current circumstances. The deal, expected to be finalized in the upcoming months, is seen as a long-term commitment to the West. Also note, French President Macron has increasingly focused on countries formerly in, the, in Russia's sphere of influence, as they say, with the Rafale deal being a sign of growing political trust between France and Serbia, as this landmark arms deal signals a significant step towards aligning with European interests. And so it should be noted here that the Serbian official that stated that buy-in from Russia is no longer feasible is especially true given that Russia's military export market has completely tanked due to the war in Ukraine and the sanctions imposed on Russia for specialist Western components. More importantly, Russia no longer has the luxury of exporting the vast majority of military hardware in the form of international trade as they sorely need it back at home to invade their neighbor. And it's probably worth a mention right here, France actually overtook Russia to become the world's second largest exporter of arms behind the USA, with Russia now dropping to roughly 6th or 7th place from memory and will likely continue to only drop further. Then in some other news, China's Peking University professor Feng Yujun, a leading Chinese Russianist, which is someone who wastes their life, oh, excuse me, which is someone who spends their academic career studying all things Russian, including politics, history, economy, military, and so forth, where Yujun believes that Russia is bound to lose the war in Ukraine due to four key factors. Firstly, the extraordinary Ukraine resistance and national unity. Secondly, broad international support for Ukraine. Third, the nature of modern warfare, which relies on industrial might and advanced command and control systems, which Russia hasn't been able to exemplify since before the fall of the Soviet Union. And lastly, Putin's information cocoon, good word, and lack of accurate information, and therefore intelligence. So I feel like you guys and I have a lot of thoughts in common with this guy, except of course for, for wanting to be a Russianist. So Yujun predicts that Russia will be forced to withdraw from all occupied Ukrainian territories, including Crimea, and that its nuclear capability will not guarantee success. He suggests that a ceasefire under the Korean scenario is unlikely, with the explanation being that Kyiv has proven Moscow to not be invincible. Also stated was that the war is seen as a turning point for Russia, leading to broad international isolation and high-risk domestic political undercurrents. Also, after the war, Ukraine would likely, very likely, join the EU and NATO, while Russia would lose influence over former Soviet republics. So it's a difficult spot to be in. Then headed across to a quick funny to round it all off today, guys, because another Russian Ural truck, the Ural 4320, was spotted with additional self-defense installed, if you can call it that, which was again working in the capacity of a frontline position as it tried to storm Ukrainian positions just by the village of Robotina in Zaporizhia. 
So aside from that drone cage, it's quite telling that the Russian army increasingly has to resort to using trucks instead of infantry fighting vehicles, or indeed tanks, to storm positions. All due to the staggering amount of Russian armoured vehicle losses which has taken its toll on their army. So this attack, just like the others from last week, you might remember if you've been watching the channel, has failed miserably. And it's not surprising given that these vehicles are called soft targets deployed in the field. So they're really not much of a replacement for the real thing, for tanks, for IFVs, which of course it doesn't match the armour for, and naturally it also doesn't come close to anything comparable with the off-road capabilities of those aforementioned vehicles either. I mean, the thing doesn't even have a cannon attached. No cannon, no armour. Genius. And this is just one of the many examples of what I meant when I said at the start of the video that strange things start to happen when Russian Soviet weapons and vehicle stockpiles run low. It's only going to get worse, and yet the belief in Russia's infinite capacity seems to be almost a religion for some. But maybe that's just the Russian comment bots that I'm thinking of. So that's it for today guys, thanks again for watching, please continue to like and comment, thanks for all the support, and I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers!